So I'm David Culler, and I was recently uh, recruited to get the uh, wonderful opportunity to to uh, welcome our, not speaker, but speakers. I understand everything is evolving uh, as we speak to the, the inaugural uh, Berkeley Data Science Lecture Series. So I guess most of the people in this room now realize that uh, Tuesday of this week at the White House, the... Uh, big Moore Sloan data initiative, $38 million, three institutions. We've been at this for a whole year and it's finally public. Uh, all happened. And uh, we have uh, scattered around in the audience here a group of us that have had way too many 8 o'clock meetings over the course of that year. Um, it's been a truly unusual process uh, to bring it together. Many of you, let me, how many of you were at the little kickoff in Doe Library um, a couple of weeks ago? Okay, so you've seen bits and pieces. Uh, this thing is really happening. There will be a uh, Berkeley Institute of Data Science or Berkeley Data Science Institute. It depends where you read what the name actually is. Um, it will initially be in 190 Doe. You walk in. Turn left and turn right, you go to that beautiful reading room, turn left, you get to have a hack and exciting things will happen. It's, it's been coming together on um, almost a spontaneous basis. Part of the process of, of winning this incredible thing were these amazing lightning talks, five minutes each from, I think, 18 different faculty from all over campus. And we all wish that we could spend at least an hour, maybe several hours. So. Um, Charles volunteered to do the first of those and in proper bids tradition immediately turned it into its own kind of mini lightning talk. So we actually have I think five speakers today or four depending how you count. So I'm only going to introduce Charles and let Charles uh, uh, introduce the rest of the team. Um, it's amazing what's happening inside our museums. Um, interesting question, how would you digitize all of these collections? You know, how deep into their DNA do you go? Uh, some of us got to do a little tour of that. So uh, Charles, of course, wears several hats. Um, he's director of the Museum of Paleontology here. He's chair of the collection of, of museums. Um, he uh, also co-directs the Berkeley Initiative of Global Change Biology. Um, he uh, is, of course, also a faculty member here. Um, also does probably three or four additional jobs. Um, and uh, blew us all away in what he could put into five minutes of <laughs> a lightning talk um, with this concept that uh, we will we will learn a lot from the very long history about how it is that we go forward in time. So this wonderful transformation of space and time that we'll get to hear a little bit about today. Charles, welcome. Thank you. So I must say, first of all, it's a great pleasure to be here. I apologize for my Chicago accent. I can't seem to shake it. Um, so, well, let me explain what we're going to try to do here. On our part of campus, which actually, as you'll see in a moment, spans most of the campus, we've been dealing with the same sort of issues that the Data Science Initiative is dealing with, which is how does one mobilize different types of data in such a way that's maximally scientifically meaningful that involves research questions and tools that are cutting edge, that involves the development of personnel that can handle those tools and can develop tools that remain become legacy tools rather than tools that have to get reinvented over and over again. And so what we're going to try to do in this talk is try to explain to you in the context of sort of global change the way that we've been doing this on campus. And so initially this is going to be a panel and what I realized is that I couldn't do what we're doing justice on my own and so what I've done is I've recruited three of our key people here to share this talk. And so the second speaker is going to be Maggie Kelly. She's a faculty member in a completely different college, um, College of Natural Resources, and in the Department of Environmental Science Policy and Management, ESPM. And she directs the Geospatial Innovation Facility that plays a major role in what we're going to say. So she's going to talk about sort of the human sociological infrastructure and the way 
GIF and the other organizations are sort of organized with respect to this endeavor. Then Michelle is in the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology, and the last two speakers are not faculty members, they are staff members, which again I think highlights one of the issues with the Data Science Initiative. How do we capitalize on people who are not faculty or students who are sort of permanent members of our community to maximize their impact? And she has this interesting title of actually being a curator of information and geospatial technologies within the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology, which has really led the country and the world in these developments. And Michael Nachman here is here, our new director of the MVZ. And then Kevin Coy, who's been leading the development team, is going to talk about how the social infrastructure and the data are actually being mobilized in an informatics type framework. And then I'll finish off with some concluding remarks. So on-campus partners, of which there's a large number, international and national partners, of which this is a small subset, a lot of them based in Europe and elsewhere, and then our funding sources that are varied from corporations to National Science Foundation. So we're concerned with the issue of global change, our human role in it, and how we can mediate the impacts of those global change. And this is uh, Tony Barnowski from Integrated Biology and from the Museum of Paleontology with Governor Brown talking about a paper that was published in uh, Nature last year on this central issue. I would say, too, that this paper was actually funded with seed funding from the Vice Chancellor of Research as part of the Berkeley Initiative of Global Change Biology, which funded the workshop of about 25 people, about 15 institutions, that led to the study that led to this contact with the governor. So already the Berkeley Initiative for Global Change Biology is having sort of a broader impact than just on campus. And I'd like to acknowledge here um, Graham Fleming for his unbelievable ability to sort of herd cats Almost the invisible hand. Not completely invisible, because I can see him, but almost invisible. And so the question then is, how are we going to sort of address environmental problems with the sort of data and informatics tools that we have as we move into the future? So I just want to remind you that the biosphere is really complex. We have some people working on... Uh, climate systems, we've engaged Bill Collins at the LBL Labs, who's doing the modelling for the latest um, IPCC report. So we have climate, we have weather, we have vegetation, we have animals, we have ocean. And so what now Maggie's going to do is tell us a little bit about the partners. Thanks a lot, Charles. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about is that. It's this partnership that we've made with entities on campus and off in a really diverse data environment uh, to answer questions about global change. And these are the people and the entities on campus that provide the data, the technology, and the resources that um, bring together the title that we were talking about, place, space, and time. And uh, the, the, the main uh, umbrella organization is one that Charles has already mentioned, the Berkeley Initiative in Global Change Biology. It was launched in 2009 with funding from the Moore Foundation, the Keck Foundation, NSF and others to bring together researchers across campus to study the impact of global change on biological systems. And it's been very successful thus far. There's over 100 affiliated faculty from eight different UC Berkeley um, departments, and they're studying a range of really fascinating topics um, as, as, as diverse and interesting as looking at lake cores and understanding and reconstructing past climate in California. There's work looking at isotopic and genomic um, signals from bees and associated pollen to, to look at how bees interact with their environment. Fascinating stuff. And also work looking at uh, thermal stressors on aquatic insects because we expect some of our aquatic systems uh, to change through time. So Big CB, that's our nickname, has uh, really uh, formed the heart of, of this enterprise and has been very successful. Another component, an important component in this uh, process is the Geospatial Innovation Facility, the GIF on campus. I'm the faculty director of the GIF and you'll hear from Kevin Coy a little bit later. He's the executive director of the GIF. We started this eight years ago to bring <coughs> mapping science and geospatial technology to the UC campus. And we do this through a range of activities. We have workshops and training that I'll tell you about. We do hardware and software support. We do research support. We have a, a series of events. GIS Day is next week, if any of you are interested, on, on Wednesday. 
And we're really focused technologically on the mapping sciences. So GIS, remote sensing, we do a lot of web mapping, <coughs> and Kevin's going to show you some of this, and a lot of data visualization. Another important entity are the, the Berkeley Natural History Museums, their biodiversity data sets, and the people that have built them. These are leaders in eco-bioinformatics development worldwide. They've, uh, through the last, in the last decade, built uh, an international consortium of biocollection collection networks such as VertNet, and there are many others, that have um, very strong international partnerships, as evidenced here um, in this map. Most of the fundamental parts of these uh, bioinformatics collection networks were built here at Berkeley, and the data and the infrastructure and the people are provide one of the pillars behind HOLS, <coughs> which is the, this engine that we're going to um, talk to you about. These kinds of endeavors, these kinds of networks, these sorts of entities that the uh, museums have created, we hope will continue to be um, accelerated and uh, reinforced through the bids, uh, the bids process or whatever the acronym we decide on is. We're also making use of uh, research <coughs> reserves and field stations, of which there are many in California. There are um, a number of them. They're owned and operated by the University of California in different ways. And they span the diversity of California's habitats and landscapes. Some of these, many of them have been in continuous um, service for decades and some even for almost 100 years now, um, collecting data, researchers on these sites doing research. And um, the data streams that come from these, these um, facilities form another one of these pillars uh, that we're making use of in this HOLOS that we're going to talk to you about today. The data consists of uh, current research, active research that's going on on these field stations. It also includes uh, data from the past, decades old research that might go dark if we don't digitize it and bring it into our, um, our and leverage it for, uh, for science. So it's an exciting way to collect um, information throughout uh, the breadth of California. Uh, we're not just uh, focused on data and people and analysis. We're also actively involved in workshops and training. So the Berkeley Initiative in Global Change Biology is sponsoring a number of active working groups here. They're also coordinating and organizing several seminars and symposia. We're affiliated with a very exciting project, R OpenSci, that was developed here at Berkeley with a Berkeley postdoc, Karthik Ram. R OpenSci is a, it's a soft piece of software that acts as a translator between any number of of scientific databases as diverse as bibliographic to uh, you know, science data. And it's an interface or, or a translator or a wrapper so that from R, from an R console, you can grab data, manipulate it, um, work with it. And Kevin in, is going to show us something about that, sort of opening up the data pipeline um, to make analysis more easy. We also do focused workshops around the campus. The GIF, the Geospatial Innovation Facility, does a, a range of mapping science workshops, GIS, GPS, remote sensing, land cover change, those kinds of things. We host, host about 20 of them a year. The Museum of Vertebrate Zoology also does uh, a number of workshops that are focused on the bioinformatics workflow, so geo, uh, georeferencing, databasing, species distribution modeling, those kinds of things. These skills, I really want to stress this, these kinds of skills that I've showed you in the last couple slides are critical for researchers and scientists to uh, do the important work that's needed for global change research. And it's these kinds of things that we hope will continue to be integrated into the BIDS um, process and that BIDS maybe will work towards developing best practices for what makes a data science literate scientist on the Berkeley campus. So all of these things together, the data, the people, the, the infrastructure form, if you will, a bioinformatics collaboratory or a collaborative laboratory, um, it, some, one in which we are building and leveraging technological advances. We're developing and implementing new ways to look at data interoperability and data standards that are needed with this really quite diverse uh, range of data that we're dealing with. 
but also importantly forging social and cultural bridges between researchers from a number of different disciplines um, that is critical because at the heart of all of this we need to be able to answer questions about global change and in the biggest one of all of those is what do we know about life on earth and so I'm going to turn the, the stage over now to Michelle Ku. she's going to talk specifically about the data that we will be working with. All right, so I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking a little bit about the biodiversity data itself, um, <clears throat> which essentially are in the care of a re uh, our collective biodiversity collections. And what I mean by that are, are uh, natural history museums, field stations, remote reserves. Uh, the, uh, you've seen some of the UC Berkeley um, resources that uh, in the maps that uh, uh, Maggie has shown us. But it also includes their respective archives, and this actually represents and an, um, creates a repository for what we know about life on Earth. Um, and when we view this catalog of life, uh, we can start making estimates about what we know and about what we do not know. And in fact, we are still in the age of discovery. Um, a mere fraction of the diversity of life is estimated to be only known, and our discovery rate is ever increasing with our new technologies um, that come to bear uh, in, the, in the fundamental sciences of, uh, of uh, taxonomy and uh, natural history. Um, what we want to be able to do eventually as we create these uh, catalogs of life is to also interpolate the distribution of species across uh, time. So here's a quick example of a uh, climate profile of one species, which is quite important to um, epidemiology, uh, Lyme disease vector. This is a tick. Uh, we have a, climate, a current climate profile, um, which we've interpolated from specimen uh, occurrence data. Uh, from this, we can also then um, use that current climate uh, profile to project into future, uh, using future climate uh, scenarios. And so this is a, a base uh, solely on climate, but you can see that there's uh, a lot of um, uh, relevant uh, uh, forecasting that could be brought to bear on um, policy management and, and, um, and uh, uh, future planning. Uh, the warm colors, by the way, are indicating uh, better places for this uh, particular vector to occur. So to accomplish those kinds of models that I quickly showed, um, we, we need to have at least two kinds of data sets. Um, we need to have a, what we're calling event-based data, which is essentially um, our species occurrence. Um, and we also need to have relevant base maps, uh, which are, can encompass all sorts of environmental data. And I'll spend a little bit of time talking about both uh, uh, forms of these data, how we're using, uh, what we're doing in our HOLOS um, uh, project to um, bring these kinds of data uh, online. So the easiest one to think about probably is our species occurrence data because these are essentially the physical, uh, physically vouchered specimens that we have in our Natural History Museum collections um, it, as well as in uh, some of our field stations. Um, over the years, we've spent uh, significant um, effort, um, both externally funded mostly from NSF, but also um, due to the effort of all the individual collection staffs at all our respective uh, museums to bring these data sets that, um, from drawers, uh, typically from specimen labels uh, and field notes, um, into a digitized and therefore accessible format. Um, it's this, it's this effort of bringing otherwise dark data into uh, databases that can be exposed to web services or to other uh, web-enabled technologies that, has, um, that we've been building experience and um, many, many technological um, uh, innovations to uh, increase our rates of uh, digitization. Um, otherwise, they'd be locked up in drawers, um, as you can see here. Um, you can also see that our rates of digitization vary tremendously across collections. Each collection has its own special uh, needs and, and issues. Um, and so we are trying to leverage all our collective experience to um, bring about and um, make more efficient um, these digitization processes across all these disparate kinds of collections as well. 
I also want to, I won't dwell much on this slide except to show quickly that for each one of those specimens, they also in itself represent a wealth of uh, network data, um, both at the mi micro and macro uh, scale of analysis. So this may include uh, links to specimen, uh, specific specimen sequences, uh, accessible now through GenBank. It could include genomic uh, sequences. It could also include links to images um, of their habitat, of their behavior, of their interactions with other uh, species. And that allows us to continuously ask research questions um, of these specimens, no matter when they were collected. So active um, research, even with the most cutting edge tools, are being employed on our actually most importantly now, our most historic of all specimens, not just our modern collections. Um, other examples of dark data that we are bringing to light are uh, the archival documentation that's locked up in our field stations throughout California. Um, so they've been cared for, but now we need to bring them um, into uh, means that we can uh, integrate them. And this excuse me, represents uh, up to a, a century of data collection in the form of field notes, uh, species lists, photographs, and uh, more importantly, we also have um, more sophisticated um, methods of data capture that we're trying to bring to bear um, in our climate sensor arrays. Now, these are traditionally used for the earth sciences, but um, biologists are now uh, taking a particular note because they are bringing, uh, because we can bring them in to more user-friendly formats for us. Um, so we're taking things like uh, millions of measurements of a variety of different kinds of uh, variables um, and able to aggregate them and uh, create more biologically relevant um, kinds of variables for us. Um, we hope to expand this, this kind of empirically based climate observations with new opportunities that are being, um, that, that are coming to bear as, uh, represented in this newly funded, um, critical zone observatory at the Eel River. And lastly, one more example of dark data, data, uh, one of our more favorite examples. We're also bringing, um, uh, to light and, and, and having the opportunity to take care of orphaned data collections. Uh, this is actually uh, a shot straight from our regatta facility over in Richmond um, of soil samples that were collected um, up to uh, 90 years ago. And these were used f uh, to help characterize the soil profiles that are still being used today by the USDA for Western North America. Um, we have students going down and visiting these collections so we can um, have these uh, digitized and cataloged and um, incorporated into our uh, collection management systems. To give context to these event-based data sets, we're also integrating them with relevant base maps, the second fundamental data type that we need to use. Um, and this includes land cover from remotely sensed uh, sources such as Landsat, uh, climate models for not just the current, but also for the future and paleoclimate uh, scenarios, um, as well as many others. Um, and these are traditionally in the realm of desktop GIS, but now we can take advantage of so much more uh, web-based um, technologies and make this uh, and, and basically lower the barrier for um, any researcher to um, access the same kinds of sophisticated data um, and data analyses that um, uh, many of us staff uh, scientists um, are specially trained in. Um, included in the base layers, uh, we're also bringing together uh, a variety of somewhat dark data. They're not entirely dark, uh, maybe gray. Uh, bringing together uh, data sets that have been, um, again, uh, historic um, from the early part of the cent uh, 20th century. Professor Weislander uh, from the forestry department spearheaded some detailed field work, uh, which he called the vegetation type mapping survey. Um, where he and his colleagues went around uh, all over California to, to map and hand draw uh, uh, topo maps um, of the d various kinds of uh, uh, vegetation types. Uh, they took specimens, they took photographs, um, and they uh, took uh, detailed plot data. And uh, a variety of different uh, PIs all throughout uh, 
Berkeley here at Berkeley as well as at UC Davis um, have endeavored through a variety of different kinds of uh, funded projects to digitize and um, make all of this data accessible um, through, through GIS. Um, with that, uh, we've finally been able to um, actually uh, geolocate several of uh, the photographs uh, and this has made um, a variety of uh, photo retakes possible, which also increases their uh, utility to um, our public out outreach. Um, this, uh, this is we, we feel like this is a, there's a huge potential for citizen science um, uh, projects that we could also um, bring to bear some of our uh, applications that we're building. Uh, and then Kevin will hopefully be able to demonstrate some of that in, in just a few minutes. Um, but this also gives us, uh, on the research side of things, uh, both a qualitative and a quantitative means for trying to understand and assess the changes over the last century. So building on these years of digitization, a century of field work, um, we can start examining empirically how species have responded to climate change in the last century. Uh, this, this is a, a quick analysis, uh, a, a summary chart uh, from our Grinnell Resurvey project uh, showing some of the responses of uh, ma small mammals in California. And I will say that uh, in summary that they, species are not responding uh, equally uh, to the effects of the last century of climate change. Um, and we can see that now that we can bring the vegetation type mapping um, project uh, into the same context that the flora is also not responding in similar ways as well. But now with the, being able to bring both the flora and the fauna and understanding their impacts, we can finally under, start standing things um, on the ecosystem and how those are, uh, how the dynamics of uh, those um, traditionally separate uh, kinds of data um, have impacts on each other. Um, and I'm going to now turn it over to Kevin so he can start uh, demonstrating some of the, the power of the applications we're building. Okay. So thanks, everyone. Um, I'm excited to start showing off some of the tools that we've been working hard on. This is very much a work in progress. Uh, what we're calling the Berkeley Eco-Informatics Engine is really the driving force uh, behind the data and informatics portion, and we're calling Holos kind of the, the gateway to this, this engine that you will be able to work with. And so we thought really hard about how do we take all of these disparate data sets coming from uh, lots of different places and make them accessible in the most uh, easy to access way to lots of different kinds of people. So this is kind of what we're working with here. And so everything we've talked about thus far has involved different event data, base layer data. And what we're doing is an API-first centric uh, development to create a data API that will allow users to access any and all of these uh, data sets and build applications and do different analyses around them. So uh, we have an API that I'll show you, uh, but we're currently also working now on a, a front end to make it much more um, accessible and user-friendly for people to search and explore these vast data sets. We'll also now be building applications around those data sets, but we're very uh, cognizant of the fact that we'll never be able to build all of the different applications that could possibly fit around these data sets. So we wanted to make it open and accessible so that other developers, and I'm hopeful that maybe some of you here might be interested in, in building applications around Holos uh, so that you can put them on your own web applications uh, or host them even within ours. And then lastly, a lot of the researchers um, in the museums and in, in the College of Natural Resources are strong in R. And so there are tools now that with R OpenSci will allow an R user to be able to directly interface with the API so that you don't have to deal with bringing all of the data on board, but you can work directly through the API with it. Um, so for the technology folks in the audience, uh, here's just a, a quick view of our web stack. And um, everything's based on open source technology and based on uh, primarily Django REST framework, the API, Postgres database, and lots of um, great tools. But none of this would be possible. I have to really um, 
really thank the development team here, Falk, Brian, Shruti, Shufei, uh, on our web application development side, and, and Joyce and Ginger in the data programming side have really uh, been instrumental and, and have brought to bear everything that you're, you'll see here in the site. So you can go today to ecoengine.berkeley.edu and access the API, which will give you formats out in GeoJSON, XML, and even some simple maps. And then what I'll show you here is, oh, gotta switch screens, what that looks like. So um, here's the, the Django REST framework API, and you could see things like all of the topics we've talked about. Uh, Michelle talked about the different specimen observation data that they have in the museums. Currently, there are 4.9 million uh, specimens records here in the database, and those can be accessed in CSV, GeoJSON, et cetera, and brought into your APIs or into your um, applications. We also have the vegetation map data. Um, we have the sensor network data, the 4 million plus uh, sensor data points, and then photos as well. Uh, not only from the Wieslander uh, vegetation map survey, but there's also uh, Cal Photos has been organizing and collecting bi biological photo collections for a long time. Uh, and so all of that can now be accessed through the API. And if you just select something like that, you'll get the, the GeoJSON code and you can use the uh, URL in your applications. So um, that part is all public. This part is still under wraps uh, and under development. Uh, the, the front end to Holos will feature you know, lots of tutorials and information, obviously, uh, a mapping exploration tool so that you can find the data, and then an application gallery. So uh, we have a few little examples of how we think the data might be used. Um, here's three that, that I'll show you. Uh, the first, we're using d3.js, which you might be familiar with, as a, a way to visualize the sensor network data. So in this example, we're looking at an air temperature sensor from the Angelo Meadow Reserve, and the data is going back to 2008 through 2013 here. And I can change that from weeks to days, and this is actually using pandas in the back end to really quickly aggregate all of that data on the fly. So the data are actually in half-hour intervals in the API, and you can tell it whatever uh, selection you want uh, from days to weeks to months, and it will quickly aggregate that. Another type example, also using D3, and also I should mention, you know, this didn't take very long at all to develop, and because of the really great open um, network of code, such as D3, where you can go in, see how to build a line chart, and copy-paste this code, insert your own data into it to develop those. Um, we have the same idea here so that the applications that we include will not just be uh, just for single use, but we'll show you the code that was used to build them so that you could also borrow from that, build upon them, and, and make bigger and better things. Another D3 example is taking uh, species checklists. So we have lots of different... Um, specimens, or actually this is observations where in those field stations every few years, they'll make a collection of how many species do we know exist in our field station. And they, they delivered this to us in you know, a long Excel list, but including that data into the API, they can now be cross-referenced back with the other, other observations and be made into much more engaging visualizations so that not only do you see which species happen to uh, have been seen in a particular place, but but their actual taxonomy behind them as well. And then uh, lastly for the examples, uh, the Wieslander data set with the georeference photos we talked about, we have over 3,000 georeference photos. And remember, this was done in the 1920s, so no GPS. Uh, they actually had the foresight to draw a point on a topo map where they took the photos. So that was how we were able to get the georeference location. And so... Um, this is, again, a work in progress, but the idea behind this application is going to be very much uh, for citizen science so that 
we can allow people to browse through the photographs and see where they are, what the landscape looked like in the past, but also invite them to try to revisit those places today, retake that same photograph so that we do have a, a qualitative um, change. And here's an example from uh, Joyce, one of our programmers actually has visited a few of these places. And you can see that there are definitely uh, structural differences in the vegetation over time. I'll also say um, another project that we have developed that's uh, in conjunction with this, but a separate project is called CalAdapt, and it's a climate change website for the state of California. But it kind of shows what we're, uh, where we're heading with the raster and base layer data that we'll be including in the engine. So here we have um, a map that's showing you projected temperature change over the next uh, 100 years. And so this is all, again, being driven through uh, the database. And it's, it's not just images, it's actual data, so that when I query a given pixel, I can output different charts and graphics and um, see lots of different things in the data. And then lastly, the, for the R users, again, um, one of our postdocs, Geo, has uh, developed a script here. He was trying to investigate the data for his own <coughs> research analyses and wanted to know if I look at all of the data in the Holos API, what's its distribution look like across the state? So he's developed this script, which I am just running now, um, which kind of gives you an idea of where are the areas that need more coverage and where are the areas where we have a lot of uh, specimens already. And when you're asking questions and, and making assumptions about uh, what your data are, are saying, that kind of information is obviously very valuable. So with that, go back to the PowerPoint. <coughs> so obviously, again, the, the uh, API is out there and ready. And if you're interested in, in building applications, definitely come talk to us. Uh, but also keep an eye out in the future as Holos gets developed. We are keeping a list of trusted testers, and if you'd be interested in, in helping us refine that, we'd be really interested in working with you as well. And so Charles will finish this up. Here. So what I wanted to do at the end before we open to sort of questions is try to step back a little bit and give you a sense of, of where we started and where we're going. And what I'm going to do is just give you one single sort of use case example of the sort of things that we had in mind. So what happened actually is about, about two and a half years ago, two years ago, uh, we were approached by the Keck Foundation who wanted to spend some money on museums and digitizing. And a few of us sat down and thought, well, that's nice. You can spend money on digitizing, but I think we can do an awful lot more than that. And so what we realized is that we'd be much more effective if we could develop an informatics infrastructure that could handle all the different types of data that are relevant to global change, that could then handle all the digital data as it comes in. So that's really where this project got seeded following the, the, the development of the Berkeley Initiative in Global Change Biology. And so here's just one simple example of sort of the things that we had in mind when we were designing the engine. So this is back to Lyme's disease again. And um, so Lyme disease is a bacterium. Actually, there are a couple of bacteria. They, one of the vectors are ticks. And, of course, in the northeast, it's deer that carry the tick. In California, they're not deer. They're a series of vertebrates. And so it turns out in terms of the vectors, sorry, we'll get to there, there are lizards, there are two mammals, there are lots of ticks hosted on the lizards, but interesting, the lizards seem to actually sterilize the ticks, which is kind of interesting. We don't know what that mechanism is. And different mammals then have less ticks, but they don't sterilize the ticks. So if you want to try to understand the likelihood of getting Lyme disease in California, you have to know where the lizards are, where the mice are, where the wood rats are. You need to know what the vegetation cover looks like. You need to know where the humans are, and you need to know where the humans are changing the vegetation and how the climate's going to change the vegetation. <laughs> and then it gets a little more complicated because the vegetation is changing. <laughs> things like sudden oak death that kill millions of trees that open up canopy that means change the habitats for the lizards and the two mammals, etc. So if you had the climate data, the geographic data the maps of the vegetation as it's changed in the past, are these spectacular changes from 
about 80 or 90 years ago. This blue is sort of oak forest that's become fragmented and changed. We can get actually historical data on the way the vegetation and the habitats have actually changed. And then if you have climate models and envelopes, you can make predictions as to why they will change. And beautifully, what you can do is back predict and use the models to say, can I take what we have today and predict what should have been there back in the past now that I have those historical records? Hmm. So for the first time, it might be possible to actually quantitatively test the predictive models that we use to go into the future by capitalizing on the rich historical data that we have trapped in our museums, our field stations, etc. So that's the long-term vision of HOLOS. And so what we've been doing over the last couple of years is utilizing the empirical data expertise, the programming expertise, the data manipulation expertise across <coughs> our part of the campus to try to develop this universal tool, HOLOS, to enable these sorts of technologies that we hope then are usable, obviously not just in California but elsewhere. So this is just one example. And what we hope is if you build a machine like this, with all the sort of cultural and um, institutional infrastructures necessary to enable it, we might be able to completely transform the way we think about global change biology. And that's one of the visions of the global change uh, biology uh, initiative on campus. And so in terms of the, um, the data science initiative, we feel in some ways this is sort of a microcosm of what the data science environment is involved in. What are the de best tools? How do you implement them? How do you train people so that they can use them? How do you develop tools so that you don't have to train people much? Actually, David Culler and Saul Pullman at a, at a meeting that uh, the VCR organized yesterday, a lunch, pointed out that you don't need special training to drive a car these days. And so wouldn't it be nice if you don't need much training to sort of do these sorts of analyses? And I think we're on the verge of that happening. And to my mind, that's the sort of direction that a data science initiative institutionally, infrastructurally, should be designed at. So what I hope I've given you is a feel for just this one part of the eco-informatics that we're involved in and sort of the different issues that we're involved in. And so finally, what I'd like to do is sort of acknowledge the team. It's fairly large. It doesn't involve all the partners. And there are three people that I would like to, to, to mention in particular. One is Rosie Gillespie, who couldn't be here, who's been a major driver of the Berkeley Initiative in Global Change Biology. And then like the invisible hand, as he leaves, there are always people behind the invisible hands that make things happen that otherwise wouldn't. And that includes people like Kaya, who's helped organize this series, it's been spectacular. And then people like um, Sarah Hinman, without whom this presentation would not have been made, for example. <laughs> so thanks to Sarah and to Gio and everybody else involved. <laughs> so we planned on about a 40-minute presentation. We've gone a little bit over, but we have time for questions. Our thought is that people really would want to get out of here by about 1 rather than 1.30, so that was our thinking. If we're open to questions. I guess it's a, technically a panel, is it? <laughs> Maybe, maybe our panel should accumulate. Why don't we... Kevin, Maggie? Yeah. Um, oh, oh yes, yeah, 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 yeah. I knew I was going to forget that, which is why Maggie's here. <laughs> and I almost forgot it, too. I was going to say, one of the things that I think shows the depth of sort of that eco-informatics and, and data manipulation is playing in our discipline now is the fact that um, the Department of Environmental Science Policy, uh, Policy and Management, ESPM, has actually just advertised a faculty position in, in eco-informatics. And so what we're seeing now is faculty positions in informatics science because of the capacity to revolutionize the way that we're doing the science. And so um, ESPM has just advertised the announcement just went out for this sort of position. So, you know, where's the money? The money is following the, the innovation here. And I think that's really exciting that that's where our science is going in this our part of the campus. So why doesn't everybody come up to the... Oh. Okay. Grab a chair and we'll take questions for a little bit. Question, yeah. Help me get the conversation started. So as you put more and more of this incredibly valuable information out there where it's available, are you also finding that new, that new kinds of collaborations form somewhat more spontaneously at you know, different parts of the planet, that some of that open source sort of methodology moves over from the code to the science itself? I think that's the dream. We're not quite there yet in the sense that what you saw has been developed just in the last few months. But that's exactly the idea, that people then can actually see data, see tools, develop tools. So we expect the network of interaction with the discipline to be, 
increase enormously with the development of this. Yeah, that's our hope. And I think it's important, you know, we want to make sure we're building something that serves as an interface between the data and the science, which can be really cloggy. And so what Kevin just showed you really briefly is critical, this kind of open API system that allows a researcher on a desktop running R to just log in, I mean, just channel into Holos, pull data, and do experimentation. We're hoping more will do that. We'll add more to the database, and it'll change the way ecoinformatics is really done, which has been a little bit more desktop-oriented um, up until this point. Well, well, maybe I'll just mention one, uh, one thought that came to me when you talked about networks and, and collaborations. I mean, I think also from the student side of things, uh, things have really changed, the whole yeah. sort of environment. I mean, our, our, uh, we're seeing a lot more uh, engagement with our undergraduate research apprentice program. Um, and I think it's partly because... Um, you know, these tools are getting a little bit easier. We have a more experience um, uh, reaching out and um, educating these um, younger students, too. So, uh, for instance, uh, just this semester, I noticed that we've all of a sudden have um, at least six uh, undergraduates wanting to either do um, a research paper or a senior thesis in the museum. And we are pointing them, I'm specifically pointing them to these kinds of tools using R, training them in the, sort of the, some of the fundamental analysis tools so they can um, access this data in a really quick way. What? Sorry. And just to, to follow on that too, I think it's, it's I'm really excited always to see how people are going to use the data set. So, you know, we're presenting uh, eco-informatics questions and stories, but the data's out there and it's accessible to anyone and, and uh, clearly people may have completely different uses of it and that's, that's part of the exciting thing. And one of the things we see very often in the GIF, uh, although we are part of the College of Natural Resources, we, we get folks from all over campus who are asking really interesting questions that might involve weather or climate or something uh, to affect politics or something else. And, uh, and you know, if we can have that kind of, of uh, growth and an interdisciplinary connection, I think that's great. Um, I teach a course in the School of Information, and I'd really love to um, carve out student projects that make use of your API. What would you suggest is one way that we can collaborate? I mean, I think one of the things I'm looking for are to be able to work with people like you who are the subject matter experts. Right. That's one of the things we've been uh, discussing a lot, and we're actually developing kind of little use case uh, examples that we can present to people who are interested in building an application uh, and kind of doing the matchmaking between the researchers who have the questions but maybe not the expertise to use this type of technology and the people who can use the technology but maybe don't have the questions. And, and so we could definitely talk a, about that and come up with some cool ideas. Yeah, so contact us. That'd be fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, That'd be, be really fabulous. Stuff. Yeah, OK. There'll be lots of, um, of opportunities there, I think. I mean, to me, one of the most exciting things is the possibility of individual people or teams writing their own applications to analyze the data in ways that strikes them, given that they can see what the data looks like. And that, that evoked <laughs> some excitement there. So. Hey. So, so I have two questions and one comment. The comment is uh, we have a data literacy hackathon coming up, and uh, we'd love to access this data and make it available, see what people come up with in 24 hours. Um, so we'll follow up with that, hopefully. But uh, the question is, is there an API for intake of data? And uh, the other question is, is there some kind of gallery for what kinds of work people have done with your data? But. So uh, <laughs> currently there's no um, API for intake, but that's definitely something uh, in the future that we will be adding. We've had so much data in amongst our own uh, networks here that we still haven't gotten them all in. Uh, but, but certainly people will want to include their own data in with these data sets to do those kinds of analyses. Um, but, but also definitely part of the front end uh, of Holos will be uh, an application gallery where we have featured both applications that we've developed and user applications that, that others have developed that other people can borrow off of. And I'm hopeful that the idea is you could use the um, search and explore tool even to find your own niche of data that you're interested in and then send that to someone else's application. So maybe you saw an example uh, that I showed 
using a specific data set, but you could send a whole different data set to that same application and run that visualization on your interest. And, um, and that, that's where we're hopeful that it's heading. So, so, the thing, so the thing I was excited about was the citizen contribution, like school kids can take a picture of a flower, you tell them what flower it is, but you also get data that that flower exists in a certain location. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's a two-way street, and some of the applications actually can be written by Berkeley groups that school kids can use um, to further their, their knowledge and also make a contribution to our knowledge base. Yeah, we have other projects in the museums that are crowdsource-based. One of them is actually just cataloging the material in the museums. Mm -hmm. So we have, another, we have a number of crowdsource-based activities along those lines. Yeah, it's just spectacular. There was... Uh, yes, you uh, are running this on EC2 with S3, and so if you are really successful, won't there be a, kind of a huge uh, uh, bill to be paid a monthly to, to Amazon? <laughs> uh, how, how does that work? <laughs> right. Yeah, no, it's a good question. Yeah, it's something question. that we're going to have to keep a close eye on. Um, you know, thus far, it hasn't been a huge problem, but, but the, the fact that it's scalable and, and that there is so much flexibility is, has been really what drew us to it. Talking about Lyme disease, there's a state interactive map now on the vector of Lyme disease and the, where the infected ticks have been found. So that's, that's up and running now, right now. So anybody can look at that and find out if infected ticks have been found in a particular locality anywhere in California. That's fabulous. And we've been working on Lyme disease here at Berkeley for 31 years, but most of our work has been concentrated in northwestern California where most people acquire their infections. But this is a statewide map, so it can inform everybody uh, what the risk is in a given area. That's superb. Yeah, that's yeah, one thing that's just staggering, every time we think we've got a new set of data, we stumble across <laughs> better, richer data that's already there. And that's one of the incredible things about this whole informatics activity. It's just staggering how many resources are out there. So building a platform that can in, you know, ingest those meaningfully, I think, is one of the challenges we face. Yeah, and um, Bob Lane there is being a little modest too because he oh, was Bob. really the uh, the kind of our uh, uh, poster child for thinking about the Lyme disease stuff, and it's a great example because it has um, this old data collected in uh, decades past with new data that he's um, making us uh, aware of now, and this really rich, complex ecological social question. It's a great. Um, emblematic case study for what we're trying to build here. So thanks a lot, Bob. So uh, thank you for the presentation today. That looks really exciting. I'm interested to play around with it in the future. And I see some people know I work with the open source geospatial group. And uh, one thing that's come up on the stage uh, thread has been, you know, how do we take in data or how do we find new sources and interoperate with it? I think, uh, you know, when you, when you have a common denominator, using open standards, then the combination of data, either from a Berkeley source or a non-Berkeley source, the friction on that goes way, way down. And it seems that the science community is very, very good with the rigor, but that they are actually behind in the ability to move interoperably the data, whereas the internet has raced forward. So I think what we're seeing is we're using internet-style tools that move data in a way that can interoperate easily and not, Berkeley doesn't have to store all the data itself because it can be mixed and matched. Yeah, right. right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one of the things I, I'm, I'm hoping for the data science initiative is that all of the different conversations can be had with all the different groups and that the functionality of these efforts will just jump up for, for the existence of bids. I mean, that's one of the, the dreams, obviously. I was going to say, too, we sort of short-shrifted the data a little bit in the sense that there's the spatial map and the names and the environments and the vegetation, but often what matters in an organism is actually what it does, what it looks like, what its morphology is, what its phenotype is, what its traits are, the meaning, ecological meaning of those traits. And so we're struggling now with how do we actually give biological meaning to the names. So I've got a particular species. And so one of the things that's happening, so for example, Chelsea Specht here sent me some slides that I didn't use because she's been dealing with the issue of characterizing the morphology using things like the advanced light source, which itself 
as a data implementation issues, and then doing the developmental biology to understand how those things change with time, and then understanding what the ecological importance of those are. So there's a whole extra level of dimensions that we didn't even talk about in this talk that involves actually dealing with the richness of the phenotype that organisms are made of, um, and trying to understand how to do that in informatics ways, I think, another challenge for the future. But I'll just add to that that, you know, that's certainly been on our radar from the very beginning of this project. And so that's, you know, a, a huge motivation why we've uh, spent a, a, as much time on the technological side as on the social side of things. You know, building these kind of uh, partnerships and uh, keeping lines of communication open between uh, folks who are perhaps working on um, the phenotype traits, you know, the ontologies that will then build on the, um, you know, common metadata standards that we can then take advantage of and build upon. So whatever we end up doing on our side will be, um, you know, compatible with things that might be uh, other experts may be bringing to bear in another um, discipline. So um, we, we've, as I said, we, it, it's, a, it's a lot of extra work. Um, it's so much easier oftentimes in the old, to use the old model of working kind of, in, um, you know, in your own bubble. But um, we've uh, purposely sometimes spent a little extra effort on our side to um, break those kind of barriers and, like I said, um, make sure that we're kept aware and we know kind of the, the key parts that are being developed in other parts of the discipline. I mean, we certainly haven't built all those bridges, but we've at least made those, um, hopefully, those professional and social connections um, right now. But again, that's something that BIDS is going to be critical for, yeah. is making sure those bridges happen face-to-face mm -hmm. -face and also um, you know, virtual networks. I think one of the other innovations that I would like to see, I've, we formed something 15 years ago called the Paleobiology Database, where we enter all the fossil record, and I'm the paleontologist, into a, into a fairly flat database. And you can choose all the data fields that you enter in, and that's wonderful, and then you realize that you want extra data fields, and then you've got to start all over again. It drives you nuts. And so there's a project that actually now based out of University of Wisconsin, which is trying to ingest the terabytes of paleontological literature in a way that as you change what you want, it can access that literature in real time and pull it back out. And so that's a way which I think will increase the dimensionality of informatics way beyond, um, there's one here, it's been a while, uh, way beyond what we've been currently envisaging in terms of sort of classic databases where you just enter the stuff that you know you need already. But that's, that's, that's a different dream. Um. So I'm amazed by how much work you guys have already done. And I was just wondering, I mean, you've been talking about Lyme disease and the sort of interaction between humans and these vectors. And so I was wondering if some of the data and, you know, a lot of the change we're seeing is human caused. So is there some effort to look at historical human land uses or incorporate indigenous mapping or, you know, sort of these more social uses of the landscape to uh, yeah. understand change and also... Yeah, so one thing which we've been very clear, very, very clear... Uh, we were very clear in our terminology that with this sort of the Berkeley Initiative in global change biology, not climate change biology, because the immediate footprint of humans often dominates the climate in urbanization, agriculture, roads, change in water courses, etc. So that actually is a major focus. We focused on sort of the data that's from the Natural History Museums. We have some groups for anthropology looking at the Native Americans and the burning and the frequency and the effect on the plant cover and the mammal cover. So that's absolutely... Uh, and I'm not a Lyme disease expert, as it's probably obvious, but um, we've been looking at imported, uh, domestic bees versus native bees, and you can pick up in the isotopes the signature of urbanization <coughs> and things like that. So absolutely. So that's a, a set of dimensions that was just too hard to capture in a talk this short. Yeah, and also in the VTM data set is perfect for that because we've got a photographic record. We also have these mapped records. We're really trying to mine it for what's natural change and what's management-related change, and that's it's a... That interplay is key to most of the research projects that we've been talking about. So great addition. With regard to that last question, we've mapped a distribution of uh, Lyme disease risk by zip code units because it gives you 1,661 versus 58 counties. So we, we have a very fine scale resolution now. We published that several years ago for the entire state. And it turns out Lyme disease risk 
is greatest in dense woodlands carpeted with leaf litter. And so that's what we built our model upon. And so based on what Charles said and the rest of the panel said, you can go back in time now to some extent 50 to 100 years or longer and predict where the Native Americans were bitten to death, such as in Mendocino County and Humboldt <coughs> Trinity counties. And you also can use the same kind of information to predict 10, 20, 50, 100 years from now based on the changes that are occurring in the environment because Lyme disease risk is driven by habitat type and, and the distribution of the animals that occur in those habitats. Those are two inter, interdependent phenomena. So this is really exciting. I mean, you can predict down the road what's going to be happening to the population in California. And one other thought about the epidemiology of a vector-borne disease is UC Davis does have a, uh, a large group of people working on mosquito-borne diseases like Bill Rison who works on West Nile virus. And this, this also would lend itself wonderfully to this type of project with global warming and what's going to happen with not only the water levels rising and creating more mosquito habitat potential, breeding habitat, but also uh, the, the primary vectors like Helix tarsalis. Where's, where's their distribution going to be in another 25 or 50 years from now? So this, this is, is a medical entomologist. I see this as one of the greatest uses of this from the standpoint of public health and epidemiology. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Bob. Yeah. I just wanted to, in this day of, this age of aggregated data and the, the disparate sources that you're dealing with and just the, the sheer volume of data, I'm curious about how you're handling, uh, first of all, vetting, proofing of the data and feedback on the data sources and accrediting the data and, and giving proper credit due and, and so forth. I think you get the idea. Right, yeah, so we're, as you're familiar with, uh, we are leveraging a lot of uh, tools that are built on other projects, so namely VertNet. And VertNet has actually um, tried to address all of those concerns, every bullet point that you've uh, laid out there for <laughs> me, um, through a variety of different uh, tools and, um, and methods. And so uh, we hope that we'll be able to take advantage of their open uh, API as well and incorporate some of that. Stuff. So, for instance, um, feedback. Um, clearly, we're not curating any of the data that we're serving up from the Natural History Museums. Um, and, in fact, that, that was actually kind of one of our, our number one goals, is we didn't want to create yet another database that needed, you know, its own staff, and, and especially since this, this wasn't our physical specimens. So what we're doing, again, based on um, sort of global standards, you know, we're using Darwin Core metadata standards, we're adopting some of uh, the global biodiversity informatics facilities um, software tools, um, namely something called um, the Integrated Publishing Toolkit, IPT. And so these create, uh, th that uh, piece of software creates um, a very nice uh, archive that allows us to then um, map whatever the incoming collections fields to these uh, global standards. Um, we can then bring those in, but the um, pointers will be directing people back to the original providers. Um, so uh, it should be very clear to the user uh, and the user who downloads any data and uses any of the data that each of those specimens actually belongs to um, a specific natural history museum. In addition, we should be able to have um, some feedback mechanisms so we could um, have folks who are using those kinds of data be able to um, communicate directly back to providers saying this works, this doesn't work, this latitude and longitude seems to be misplaced. You know, those sort of fundamental things that really are the provenance of the, of the original um, collection. So that's a good point, though. I think similar um, structures on the base layer side, making the GIS kind of, you know, the layers. We have our own set of standards that we basically uh, report um, when they're provided to us from the, uh, or the, or the data originators. <coughs> and Kevin can talk a lot at length about how we've worked through those challenges with the CalAdapt project. But yeah, these are great questions. So CalAdapt has a very civic quality. And, um, but if I were a real estate developer, I'd look at this and say, okay, I'm going to sell short on Central Valley because it's going to get really hot and I'm going to buy your state. And, and, and in other words, this data has ramifications. Can you say something about the importance of this data being held here at Berkeley as opposed to at Google and, and how are you anticipating um, 
people taking an interest in it that is economic and um, not necessarily collective. I guess I could start with that. Well, uh, Caledonian <coughs> specific is statewide data, so that was uh, from the California Energy Commission sponsored research. And the, the whole idea behind that project specifically was that there were amazing data sets that scientists have created, but they were you know, stuck in someone's hard drive. And we really wanted to uh, create a, a place where not only scientists could access it, but uh, decision makers who maybe not are not GIS experts, but are people who, who um, are making decisions right now that could use this data to inform it and then just uh, general public users. And so, um, you know, they've been very open with the data, and I think that's one of the questions we've often come across with, with Holos as well is, um, you know, do we include data sets that are not open, that are private, uh, and how and when do we do that? And, and it's an ongoing question. Thus far, everything that is included is wide open for use, um, you know, and, and each institution does have their own usage requirements, but, but they're all open, uh, but, but they're definitely data sets that maybe don't fit that model, uh, and it's, it's definitely going to continue to be something that we all have to uh, work on. And I, I, I think that's probably a question that lots of us struggle with all the time, and, and so that's something that I think we could also benefit from uh, working more with others. But as a follow-up, too, I think part of your question was, it's at Berkeley, not at Google, right? There's significance there, and that's, that's actually true when the the um, proposal call for proposals came out it was the state wanted to host something at a UC campus at a at a University of California campus and but interestingly the prototype that was built before Caladapt had actual Google um, participation and we started there but we actually changed it completely so it's the the prototype that was built with the Google input has been, was completely changed to what Caladap now is. So it's all open source, it's hosted here. I think that actually is a message. I think that is, um, makes a statement about the data. And again, but we, we, we deal with this all the time. We, we try to build this with many different audiences in mind, not just scientists, but also planners and homeowners and real estate people. And um, so we're, we're serving the data in a way that makes the, the, the um, access to the data lessened so everyone can use it. I mean, so if that helps a little bit in answering your question, it's an interesting one. Mm. Yes, a very interesting question. Yeah, the social use of data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. You've got a microphone coming. <laughs> so somebody had mentioned about uploading data and when you have your own data set that you want to um, interact with using your, yeah. your system and yeah. your system is really nice. I was also wondering about um, other sort of large efforts like iDigBio where they're doing massive digitization efforts across um, natural history museums right. um, in the country. Do you guys have... Are you interacting with them? Do you have plans to absolutely. be able to integrate those collections? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, many of our individual uh, collections are already uh, working on um, NSF uh, IDBC uh, grants, you know, advancing digitization bio collection grants. And so they are um, sort of mandated through those programs to be interacting with IDIGBio and sharing this kind of data. But on top of that, um, VertNet, this other um, NSF-funded project that's um, housed at the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology, where I work, um, you know, has direct interactions with iDigBio. We're part of their working groups. Uh, we have uh, some of our VertNet um, uh, PIs working with iDigBio uh, training groups. They have actually taken some of our course material, the workshops, um, specifically more on like the georeferencing and the data quality and fitness for use um, material and actually have um, uh, televised them, you know, created these so webcasts. So there's a, a lot of interactions to be able to share as broadly as possible. So I think the bottom line is sort of the API-based technology. So the IDIG Bio is NSF's program to digitize the roughly billion specimens that sit in natural history collections in this country. And so the point is because the API basically accesses the museum databases, it accesses what's in the museum databases. And so if those things have digital images, then it accesses those digital images. And if they're things like Darwin Core, other standards, those data 
agree to them, they're accessible. So in some respects, that's a direct pipeline to all of those other national uh, efforts in, in digi digital, digitally, digitally recording data. So that's a smooth and easy fix that's got no, no issues. You've all done a wonderful job in a very short period of time. Not done yet. Of sharing a, <laughs> a, a lot of information. But, but for some of those, us who, who are tyros at this, will you be giving additional workshops where, for user groups where yeah. individuals that like to get more involved? Uh, We're just getting started. Absolutely. So that, <laughs> that, that's something that you'll send around notices. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, the engine's just about ready for release. And when it's yeah. ready for release, then, then the issue of training and exposure will... Yeah, we, I mean, yeah. we, we need your data really badly. <laughs> so <laughs> we've, been, we've been talking about it quite a lot, actually, in our weekly or monthly meetings of different groups. So, yeah, it'd be fabulous. Great. Thank you very much for what you've done today. Well, thank you all. Thanks for coming. Thank